Hello and welcome to the 11th exercise on reinforcement learning. This is Max Schenke speaking and today's topic will be eligibility traces. We've already seen that n-step learning is a generalization of Monte Carlo learning and temporal difference learning. In this exercise we want to have a look at an even further generalization step, which is namely the eligibility trace. Recall that in n-step methods we had the decision on how many steps we want to take into account for each update. This approach gives advantages of flexibility to balance between the low bias of Monte Carlo and the low variance of temporal difference learning. However, there is still room for improvement. Intuition tells us that recent actions are more responsible for the current situation than actions in the distant past. Therefore, it is of interest to implement some decay factor, which will decrease the change applied to the policy if the given actions lie further in the past, and that is what eligibility traces are for. In order to check whether these eligibility traces are useful or in how far they are useful, we will have a look at the mountain car example once again. In order to make use of eligibility traces in function approximation, we need to pre-process gradients, which makes the procedure of learning a little bit more cumbersome here. The point is that we do not want to apply the gradients to the weights right away, but we need to pre-process them first, so that we can then afterwards apply the pre-processed gradient then. And of course, TensorFlow gives us a lot of tools already, for example the apply gradients method that we already have seen in the last exercise, but the built-in methods also take away some degree of flexibility, so we want to work around them and replace them with our own code this time. So the first problem we need to solve is to calculate this gradient as it stands here. If we recall the last exercise, we calculated the gradient there like it is shown here. And this, of course, is a little bit different. It's not the raw gradient of the action value with respect to w, but it's this gradient and also the td error delta and our learning rate alpha. However, the factor alpha delta is not to be applied right away, but we want to apply it later when applying the processed gradient. So we need to isolate this gradient here. Of course, we could do this with some workaround, but this time we can also do it differently. We do not need to use the quadratic loss function like we did the last time, because the quadratic loss function will, of course, also bring these factors with it. But we can also make use of a mean loss function. So not mean squared error, but just mean without the error. This loss function will then be linear, so the gradient that we are getting will not include the temporal difference error. I have prepared a little derivation to point this out. So what we used in the last exercise was the quadratic TD error as the loss function, so the mean squared error. And of course, if you apply the gradient with respect to W to it, or the semi-gradient, I should say, we only calculate the derivative with respect to the prediction and not with respect to the target. That's why this one here is all only a semi-gradient, not a true gradient. And as we can see, the semi-gradient is not purely the gradient of the action value, but also the TD error and a factor of minus two. If we then use the apply gradients function from TensorFlow, then the gradient will be applied in a gradient descent manner. So the apply gradients will always perform gradient descent. That's in the nature of TensorFlow and how it is used in supervised learning. That's what makes it easy to use there. And now, in our case, of course, we already have a negative sign here. So the gradient descent will, in fact, eventually end up in a gradient ascent because of the double negation here. And if we compare this update equation to the update equation given in the algorithm, as given here, we see that it's, in fact, nearly the same with the only difference that there's a factor of 2 in here and this factor is missing over here. But generally speaking, this factor does not make a huge difference because a factor of 2 is much less than an order of magnitude. And this is mostly what alpha is about to decrease it by several orders of magnitude. So a factor of 2 really does not make a huge difference. So in the end, putting this temporal difference error into this update equation is nothing you have to care about if you used the mean squared error function. But when we now have a look at the algorithm concerning the eligibility trace, 
we see that the TD error is not coming up here. So in this case, it's not the easiest way to use the mean squared error because we don't want the gradient to include the temporal difference error. We usually just want this gradient of Q with respect to W and thus it's easier to use the mean network output and not the mean squared error. The mean here has to be understood in the way of a batch average. So as long as we are observing sing single samples, it doesn't make a difference, but if we later want to use maybe mini batches, then the inclusion of this mean already allows us this generalization directly. The same is of course true for the mean squared error. The squared error would be sufficient if you have single samples, but the mean squared error then also allows you to compute the gradient on mini batches. So this explains why we used the mean function here or defined the mean function here so that we can use it later when we define the loss. With exception of the mean loss, there is no actual surprise in this gradient tape this time. So yeah, this is the only thing that's new here. But then we also would normally use the apply gradients function. And this time we will replace this by our own code. So at first we need to get the momentary weightings of the neural network. This is easily done by using the get weights command on the model. Then we get the weights listed in a structure I call W. And W is a list of arrays. So for every layer, there is an array. The arrays are from NumPy, the list is from Python. And because one structure here used here is a list and the other one is a NumPy array, we can't do arithmetics on W itself but we first need to get the arrays out of the list. So we need to loop through the list elements and then we can perform any operation on the gradients or on the weights. So this is an example what you could do then. And yeah, this is then the simple SASA operation that we used in the last exercise already. Then now we have the updated weights and we need to get them back into the model and this is what is done here. We set the weights to W after W has been updated and now yeah, we have new set of weights in our network. Of course there are possibly other ways of doing this but I think this way gives us a lot of flexibility to handle the gradients so that we can apply them the way we want to either with pre-processing or even without processing. In task number one, we now want to implement the Sasa Lambda algorithm, which is an algorithm with an eligibility trace. And we want to do it for this case with neural networks. So we have an ANN approximator in the same way we did it in the last exercise. Again, we are using the radial basis function featureizer here. And yeah, the most differences then will come up in this algorithm. First, we need to initialize the variable Z to zero. And yeah, as we have seen, we can do this in the form of a loop. So Z has the same structure as the weights of the network. So we can use the weights of the network and then overwrite them with the zeros in order to initialize Z appropriately. Then further down in the algorithm, the usual procedure can be seen here for getting new information. So the general action Selection is not really new. There is no important change to be applied to this. It's the same as in the last exercise. However, as just stated in the introduction, we now use the gradient tape with respect to the mean of the network output. So we do not calculate the error here and calculate the mean of the error, but we just calculate the mean of the network output. So this is a pure output without the target involved. And to account for that, we calculate the temporal difference error in order to use it directly when applying the weights, as also seen in the introduction. So in this loop, the interesting part happens. We have Z, which is our short time memory, so to say, um, where we accumulate the gradients, but also make use of this decaying factor, lambda. And after we updated our short term memory Z, we now use this short-term memory to also update our long-term memory, which are the weights of the neural network. And then we set the weights so that we can use them in the next step. Of course, the 
proper selection of lambda is again a science in itself. We have some degree of freedom to make use of this and can always change according to the task. However, as it was often in this lecture, it's not, not usually obvious which parameter to choose for this. So it's often necessary to perform a hyperparameter optimization and have a look at it in a little more comprehensive way. With our selection of lambda equal to 0.1, we will in the end receive quite good results. As we can see here, the episode length is lower than 200, so the agent is able to solve the environment and also the value plot on the state space looks as expected. In order to investigate the choice of a proper lambda a little bit more, I prepared some more training runs with lambda equal to 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.25 and 0 0.4. I started 50 training processes for each lambda and the average learning curve is depicted here. As we can see, the utilized training setup responds positively to lower values of lambda. For higher values it learns slower. Let's have a look at the lower lambda values a little bit more in detail so that we can compare them. In this plot now we can only see lambda equal to 0 and lambda equal to 0 0.25. And as you can see, lambda equal to 0 0.25 learns a little bit faster in the beginning, so the drop of episode length comes earlier. However, both of the agents seem to forget after this first down peak here, they seem to forget what they learned already and then start from this point on to learn anew. And also here we can see that lambda equal to 0 0.25 learns a little bit faster than lambda equal to 0. So we have a little advantage here. But the fact that this is still very noisy, although it's already averaged over 50 runs, also tells us that this is still a very unstable training process. In the end, both values of lambda are pretty much the same after 500 episodes. And um, yeah, if you train longer episodes, it also has to be expected that they are equally good. Yeah, but in the beginning, the lambda equal to 0 0.25 is a little bit faster at learning. Of course, this observation only holds for the mountain car example that we now looked at. So discrete action space and radial basis function as a featureizer for the state space. If you have a look at different environments, of course, the result can be very different in the end. So it is oftentimes also the case that a higher lambda is more advantageous, but in this case, this is not what we observed. That should be everything about the neural network function approximator, so now let's have a look at task number two. In a similar way, we were able to use the least squares policy iteration in exercise number 10. There also is a powerful algorithm that we can use for Zaza lambda in the case of linear function approximation. The name of the method is true online Zaza Lambda, and this has the advantage that the update that is applied to our short-term memory Z, and hence the update that is applied to our network weights, are more precisely in terms of the true value that we only were able to approximate when we were using a nonlinear approximator as in task 1. We are again making use of our radial basis function featureizer, and now let's have a short look at the algorithm. Essentially, this is a computationally very simple algorithm. The only calculations that have to be performed here are of algebraic nature. So it's a very efficient algorithm in the end. And since it's a linear function approximator that we are using, we are also able to compute the results very fast. So let's have a look at the estimated value function over the state space. As we can see in these episodic results, the agent is able to solve the environment quite early, so we do not even need 50 episodes and the agent is already quite robust when solving the environment. Although the value function is not yet estimated accurately, but um, yeah, anyway, the behavior of the agent is already acceptable very early. Also in this algorithm, we have the freedom of choosing lambda in the desired way. So also here I did a little more investigation on how to choose lambda or to see if lambda has a huge effect on the training process. As this algorithm with the linear function approximator is able to train so much faster, I managed to get a lot of more information on the tendency 
of the agent. But also here you can see that for quite large lambdas, the training behavior doesn't get particularly better. So for the pinkish line here, you see that the training behavior or the stationary performance was quite the worst. And also for the brownish line, which is here the lambda equal to 0 0.9, the performance on the environment is also not the best. However, if we filter this a little bit, we see that the tendency here seems to be a little bit different than for the ANN approximator. We also see that the lambda 0.25 agent trains a little bit faster than the lambda 0 0.0 agent, as can be seen here, the orange and the blue line. But then again, the agent with lambda equal to 0.8, the green line here, was able to beat both of them, it learns faster than both of them, and is able to converge to the same or a similar baseline in the end. So here we cannot observe the same, that a lower lambda is the best, but here a higher lambda is the best without any change to the environment, just some change to the featureizer and for, to the function approximator, of course. And also interesting, I think, is that here the first down peak that we were able to observe for the ANN is not visible. So we were able to observe for the ANN that it got better for the first moment, then a little bit worse, and then it started to learn regularly. And here it starts to learn regularly quite from the very beginning. And of course, this is interesting, but this seems not to be a problem of the eligibility trace, but a problem of the environment or problem of our setup on the environment. What I didn't show you now is the interdependence of using the correct alpha and the correct lambda. So your choice of lambda might depend on your choice of alpha and vice versa, but optimizing for both of them, of course, will take much more time. And so it will not be included in this video. Of course, feel free to try it yourself and see if you can get a better combination of those parameters so that it learns even faster for the ANN and of course also for the linear function approximator. So for the end of this exercise, let's take a calm second to have a look at the mountain car in action again and appreciate the performance of the linear function approximator. That's it for today. Thank you for listening. See you next time. Cheers.